Welcome back to Scientific Archer. Today is going to be another installment in my series looking at the performance of light versus heavy arrows downrange. In previous episodes, we looked at the momentum, kinetic energy, as well as the velocity of arrows. And in the last episode, we looked into a concept of what I'm referring to as the range forgiveness of an arrow. If you're interested in those videos, I highly recommend starting from the beginning to get caught back up to what this study entails. As a reminder, all of the data we're going to be looking at today was collected with a lab radar shooting arrows ranging from 350 all the way up into 650 grains, which is the minimum recommendation by the Ashby Foundation. So I was using my Matthews Lift 29 and a half to collect this data, and I was shooting at 60 pounds with a 27 inch draw length. In today's video, I want to talk about time to target and why that matters to us when we're bow hunting. So when we're talking about time to target, I'm specifically referring to the time from when the arrow is released until it gets to whatever you're shooting at, at whatever distance. The further you're shooting, the longer the animal is going to have to react to the shot and potentially move. It's one of those very significant things that can cause us to miss where we're intending to hit on the animal. All right, without further ado, let's get into the data. Feel free to pause this video at any time and look at either the charts or the visualizations a little bit longer, have time to digest them. So this first set of charts that I wanna show everyone is what I'm referring to as time to target and time to react. So the time to target's a little bit simpler. That is the time in seconds that it is going to take for your arrow to reach your target at whatever distance in these five yard increments out to 60 yards. The color coded area of this chart transitions from green, which are your shortest durations of time for your arrow to reach your target, all the way to the red numbers that are the longest durations for your arrow to reach that target. And one of the obvious things you'll notice when looking at this is that the arrows that have the higher velocities are going to reach the target quicker. And even while we're experiencing the drag due to air resistance, you're still going to notice those faster arrows are still going to reach your target quicker. And just like the previous video looking at range forgiveness, I really like to hone in on the 450 grain arrow and the 650 grain arrow. If we just focus on the 450 grain arrow and the 650 grain arrow at 20 yards, you'll see that it takes roughly 0 0.043 seconds longer for the 650 grain arrow to reach the target. That might not sound like much, but in the game of inches that is whitetail hunting, that could be a considerable amount that might cause your arrow to hit further away from your intended impact point if you were to use the heavier arrow. In some of the later charts, I want to get into that stuff specifically and show some numbers related to that. But mainly right now, I'm just trying to set the stage as to how I get to those values. In this next chart on the right, you'll see what I'm calling the time to react. So it's not just the time of flight that is going to matter, but also the time that the animal has to react. Sound does not instantaneously get to the target when your arrow is fired. Sound itself is going to take some duration of time before it actually reaches your target. So if we jump to this chart really quick, this shows you the duration of time that it takes for the sound to travel to whatever distance you're shooting. You'll likely have experienced this. If you ever go to a major league baseball game and you have outfield seats, if a batter hits the ball, you'll likely see the ball traveling out towards the outfield before you ever hear the crack of the bat. In that distance, you know, if you're sitting in a major league field, you're likely to be more than 360 feet away, which really correlates well to the 120 yard distance here, where it takes almost a third of a second for the sound of the baseball hitting the bat to reach you in the outfield. So jumping back into that time to react chart, you can see that the time to react is the time to target minus the sound trap time. So you can see comparing them to the other side, they just subtract those values from each of the distances here down below. So it's not even really the time to react that truly matters for how much an animal is gonna move. The animal still has to process that it heard the sound and then make that decision to move. And for that, I have a chart that I'm referring to as time to move. So it's that time to react minus the reaction time of the animal. For this, I elected to estimate it based around the reaction time of an Olympic sprinter. Figured that was a fairly decent correlation to it that I could actually put a concrete value to because the reaction time of a deer is not a very well-known value. You see here, this is where it gets a little bit more unique where in these five and 10 yard ranges, you can see that some of these values are actually negative. That means that the arrow would reach the animal before it has time to move. So that time for the sound to reach it and its reaction time 
are greater than the time it took the arrow to actually reach the target. One of the things I recognize in looking at this is those time values, it's still hard to put a tangible amount. So in order to do so, I wanted to look at a assumption based around if the animal was dropping at the acceleration of gravity. And that's what we have here on the next chart over on the right hand side. So in this chart, it's assuming that given those times that the animal has to move, if it starts to drop at the rate of gravity, how far will it move before the arrow reaches the target? You can see here, once again, in much of the five to 10 yard distances, the animal really does not have much time to move whatsoever. And that's reflected by them moving a very small distance. Once we get out to some of the further yardages, especially the 20 and beyond, you can see that this is where the performance of the arrows start to separate themselves. If we focus on the 450 grain arrow and the 650 grain arrow, specifically for a 20 yard shot, you'll see that with the 450 grain arrow, the deer is likely to be able to move 0.77 inches while if you're using a 650 grain arrow, the deer can almost move two and a quarter inches by the time the arrow reaches it. One of the other things I'd like to point out with this is it does not take into account that the deer might react differently to the shot when they are at those further distances. So it assumes that whether you're at these close distances or all the way out to 60 yards that the deer is going to react the same way. That's not exactly the case all the time. When a deer is further away, the sound of the bow going off is going to be less intimidating to them the further they are out. You'll commonly hear this referred to as that animal of bubble. Once you're within those distances, anything that happens in those distances, they're going to be much more reactive to the shot. So these charts more reflect a worst case scenario to demonstrate the difference in performance of these light versus heavy arrows. This is definitely one of those things that shows that going to a heavy arrow might not necessarily be the best decision if you're looking at hitting the exact location you're aiming at. Any animal that you're hunting is very likely to react to the shot and move before the arrow reaches it and you do gain a little bit more forgiveness by shooting slightly lighter arrows. So all of these values for this gravity based drop chart they're all the raw values that are produced using the assumption that the animal is dropping at the rate of gravity but really what does that actually mean to you as a bow hunter? For this next chart I took those same values and applied them to the white-tailed deer hunting situation. So in this chart instead of the values being color-coded from high to low I color coded it based around the size of the vitals of a white tailed deer. So you see here the green values, once again, these are your very small miss distances. It quickly transitions right around that 15 to 20 yard range, depending on the weight of the arrow, to this yellow range where you're missing, you know, somewhat reasonably, but you're still going to likely catch a majority of the vitals and still successfully harvest the animal. And then all the way down towards the bottom, once you get beyond the 35 to 40 yard distances, this is where you'll see the transition to the hard red values that are struck through. These values are all where if you were aiming at the bottom one third of a white tailed deer's vitals, you would end up missing high because the animal was able to jump the string and duck, either causing you to hit it in the spine or miss over its back entirely. So once again, looking at the 450 grain arrow versus the 650 grain arrow, in order to still hit the animal lethally in the vitals, for a 450 grain arrow, you can get all the way out to a little bit beyond 35 yards and still clip the top of the lungs, where if you were to hunt with a 650 grain arrow using that same bow setup, you'd likely only get just under 30 yards before the animal could duck. This is one of those things where it's commonly said with whitetails, you really do want to keep it under 30 yards. Once you get beyond 30 yards, this is really the complication that you're dealing with. Whitetail deer are extremely reactive animals, and there's plenty of videos on the internet of whitetail deer completely jumping the string and causing the arrow to miss over their backs. The next color you'll see here is this bottom right hand corner where you see all of these black values. This is where those values using that gravity based assumption for the animal drop just kind of come unrealistic. Realistically with a white tailed deer, they're only going to drop until they bottom out and they're able to run. So for that reason, I just wanted to exclude them from this just so it doesn't cause any confusion. I definitely recognize that most people aren't numbers guys like myself. So I wanted to create some visuals to help people understand that a little bit better. So in this first one, this is what it would look like specifically for a white tailed deer shooting at 20 yards. I assume that the area you'd be aiming at is that lower one third point at the vitals, which kind of correlates to just that like top of the heart region. 
So in this visual, you can see here that the blue dot is the aim point that you chose to shoot at. The green dot is the location a 450 grain arrow would hit, assuming the animal dropped at the rate of gravity. So here you can see for the 20 yard case, you're barely missing high with the 450 grain arrow. If we move on up, you can see here that the purple dot correlates to the 650 grain arrow. And once again here, this shows that hunting whitetail deer and restricting your shot distance to roughly 20 yards is honestly a really good decision because even going all the way up into the 650 grain arrow, this is still going to result in a hit that is in the center of the lungs, which is a very good place to be when you're hunting deer. All right, so that's the 20 yard range forgiveness, but now let's move on and look at the 30 yard range forgiveness. This is one of those things where you'll see that the moderately weighted arrow at 450 grains gains an advantage over the 650 grain arrow. So once again, that blue dot reflects the aiming point at the lower one third point on the vitals. And the green dot correlates to where the 450 grain arrow would hit, assuming that the deer dropped at the rate of gravity. So even in this case, just moving out 10 yards further, you can see that the 450 grain arrow is going to hit much higher on the deer than when you're shooting at 20 yards. But once again, with the 450 grain arrow, you're still going to have a good vital hit high in the lungs and it's likely going to be a lethal hit on that animal. Now looking at the purple dot, which correlates to the 650 grain arrow, you can see that it did not do so well in this situation. Because the animal was able to drop, hearing the sound of the bow going off or that arrow as it comes in flight, it was able to drop all the way down to the point where the arrow is going to hit it in its spine. That would not be a good hit on a white-tailed deer. At best, you're gonna be severing the spine and have to take a follow-up shot, but it's still very likely that you might hit above in the back strap area, and that deer is very likely going to survive that shot. The reason I wanted to look into how much an animal can move based around the different arrow masses is it's one of those things that's commonly not talked about when looking at the performance of light versus heavy arrows. Everyone seems to focus exclusively on arrow penetration and that's only part of the problem. It's not just getting through your target that matters to us as bow hunters, but it's also getting to the target. I'm definitely not going to argue that a lighter arrow is going to penetrate better than a heavy arrow, but if the deer is able to move significantly before the arrow gets there for all these heavier arrows, especially if you go much above 650 grains, then kind of what's the point? It might be worthwhile to take a lighter arrow, something even moderate in the 450 grain range that is going to reach your target faster so you can hit closer to your intended aiming point that still has the momentum necessary to penetrate the target that is likely going to lead you to be more successful in the field. I'm going to have more content that comes out on this topic in the future. So if you do like this type of stuff, feel free to subscribe. If you have any questions on this, feel free to reach out to me in a YouTube comment. Another great way of reaching out to me would be following along on Instagram at Scientific Archer. Feel free to shoot me a direct message on there if you have any questions on this as well. Once again, I want to thank everyone for watching, especially if you made it this far in the video. I really appreciate it and I hope you find this interesting as well. 